It's safe. We all believe in God. But when you step into that new environment where nobody believes in God, you're in trouble. It's like going to Texas, the ballpark in Arlington, and wearing a Yankee jersey. That takes guts. It's like going to the Cowboy game and wearing a Redskin jersey. Boy, I don't know if that's wise. You might not make it out of here. Or a Viking jersey. I'd be careful over there, Sierra and Sione, when you do that. You've got to be careful. Joseph is now experiencing where he has to believe in God by himself. No one's around him. He's alone. He's had to work alone. He's had to develop his own work ethic. No one's encouraging him. He's by himself. He's working alone. But I think the greatest thing, or the last thing, is that he has endured alone. You know, you might have a job. You might wonder, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And you kind of think, well, I'm going to try to work my ladder and try to do this and that. Joseph doesn't have that. He's in prison. There is no way out. He's sent there by a crazy uh, Potiphar. He doesn't have a way out. We watched The Count of Monte Cristo last night. It's a wonderful movie where he is sent to uh, Chateau d'If, and he's left there by himself. There is no way out. He's alone. That character is alone, and Joseph is alone. He doesn't know how much longer he's going to do this, but he's learning to endure. He's learning to endure and believe at the same time. And then lastly, I think what Joseph is learning is he's learning humility. He's learning that he is not all that he perceived himself to be. God is going to work in him. God is going to develop him, and humility precedes wisdom every single time. You might be a smart guy. I've seen a lot of smart guys, but they're arrogant. There's something about being humbled. And you're humbled as God subtracts. You're humbled as God takes you through the ebbs and flows of life. In fact, I was talking to Zach this last week. We were talking about music. We are talking about all kinds of things. And I learned several years ago that a singer's voice matures at 35. I don't know why. I think it's because of the practice and the effort that they put into their voice. That fine, the muscles are all toned just right. It's seasoned at 35. And it got me thinking, I wonder what seasons a Christian more to my point, is I wonder what seasons a leader, more applicable to me, I wonder what seasons a pastor, what seasons a preacher. And I've stood in front of young preachers, and they're great, and then I've stood in front of the old preacher, the seasoned preacher. You know the thing that's different between the young preacher and the old preacher? I'm in the middle. I'm not young. I'm not old. Amen? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> what stands in the difference there? When I stand and I listen to that seasoned preacher, you know what he's been through? tragedies. Some of the greatest preachers I've ever heard have been through some of the greatest tragedies I cannot imagine. They've been seasoned, and with that seasoning has come humility, and they have learned that they need God. They don't just have all of the answers. They know which answers really work and which ones you really need. I was listening to Swindoll preach one day, and he told Chuck Swindoll preach one day, and he was telling us that at seminary, he was telling us that when he was young, he would die on every hill when it came to his doctrine. He says, now I'm old. I have seven hills I'm willing to die on. You can have all the other ones. I just have seven. Seasoning. What, Jake, what Joseph has learned in his experience is how to be humble. God is seasoning him because wisdom is preceded by humility. Wisdom needs humility. See Moses, see David, see Daniel, see Peter, see Paul. See the whole Old Testament. Humility precedes wisdom. Wisdom without humility smells arrogant and proud. God is seasoning Joseph. So God is at work. What is God doing while we wait? He's working on us. He's causing you to be the person that he wants you to be. He's working on you while you wait. He's not wasting time. He's developing you. And look at Joseph's story. Through God's providence in Joseph's circumstance, God is going to receive the glory in all things. Look at how it happens. While God works on us, while we wait. Look what happens to the life of Joseph. It's in verses 1 through 13, and I realize our time is short. We don't have time to go through each verse, but let me show you kind of just in a highlight. I think the primary character of this whole story is Joseph, and Joseph is being worked on while he's unaware. He has no idea what's going on up above. He's completely unaware. Check it out. Upstairs, Pharaoh has a dream. He has a frightening dream. Two dreams. The Pharaoh is panicked by these two dreams that deal with uh, cows and with grain or wheat stalks, uh, and he's terrified with these dreams. He doesn't know what is going to happen. And so he calls all the wise men together to interpret the dream, and they have no idea how to interpret the dream. The cupbearer goes, wait a minute. 
I remember a guy. Two years later, he remembers a guy. It's probably at his most advantageous moment. He remembers this dream interpreter down in prison. But Joseph has no idea. He is completely unaware that any of this is happening. He doesn't know about Pharaoh's dream. He doesn't know about the next 14 years. All he knows is that he is called to be faithful, working as a prison manager. That's it. He's unaware of what God is doing, how God is working. He doesn't know. Have you discovered this in your life? You never beat yourself there. You're going to get there when you get there. You never get there before you get there. Following me yet? You're trying to get to work and you're running late. Do you know that you're not going to get there before you do? (laughs) Sounds silly, but I've noticed this in my life. If I'm running late somewhere, the whole time I'm running late, you know what I'm doing? Looking at my watch. Do you do this? Okay, I look at my watch going, oh, I'm late. Every time I look at my watch, guess what? I'm still late. I keep looking at my watch going, oh, I'm, I'm still late. I'm still late. And so I keep obsessing about my watch. When I go running, not as often as I used to, but when I would run, I would run, I run for 30 minutes. And so you know what I do every 30 seconds? I look at the clock. Do you know that 30 seconds is 30 seconds whether you look at the clock or not? A minute is a minute no matter how many times you look at the clock and check the clock. It's still going to take a minute for a minute to get by. You never beat yourself there. You're always there when you get there. This is not an excuse for procrastination. I can see someone thinking that. Ah, well, then I just tell my dad I got here when I got here. If you leave on time and get there on time, you'll be fine. But you can really obsess with yourself thinking, what's happening? What's happening? i got to hurry. i got to hurry. i got to hurry. i got to hurry. And you end up wasting the experience. God is working while you're unaware You're thinking, what is God doing? What is God doing? What is God doing? I've done this in my life. When I'm waiting for God to do something, I'm wondering, God, why aren't you doing this? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Is he doing this? Is he doing that? What God wants us to be is still. Just let me work. Bob, you're not going to get there until I get you there. You're not going to know until I want you to know. So just be right where you are. The best thing you can be is where you are and be there. Be where you are. Joseph just works. He's unaware of what God is doing. Has no clue. All he can do is be right where he is. Don't worry about tomorrow. Today's concerns are too great as they are. God will take care of tomorrow when you get there. Just be right where you are. And Joseph has learned that while God is, while he's completely unaware of what's going on, God is at work inside of Joseph's life. He knows nothing of God's actions. He only knows God's promises. That's it. He believes completely in God, knows nothing of God's actions, doesn't know what God is doing, only God's promises. And church, that's all we need to know. God's made some promises, and He keeps every single one. While you are unaware of God's actions, you are aware of God's promises. And that's what you hold on to. Notice what's next. It's in verses uh, 15 through 37. Is not only Joseph unaware, Joseph is prepared. Notice he goes into this setting and he's ready to give an answer. And this is what indicates to me that Joseph has a very soft heart towards God. Joseph hears the Pharaoh's dream all over again. It's the dream of the cows and the dream of these stalks that devour each other. And you kind of think about how creepy this dream is. you get got seven ears of wheat eating other seven ears of wheat. Okay, cows don't eat cows. Do we all know that? That's kind of freaky. Uh, wheat doesn't eat wheat. That, that's not how that works. And yet you've got these carnivorous cows eating bad cow disease. You know, they're eating all these things. It's a crazy scene. Joseph wakes up afraid, or Pharaoh wakes up afraid. But notice how Pharaoh is answered to when Joseph gets the question. Now, Joseph said to Pharaoh in verse 25, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told to Pharaoh what he is about to do. It is what God is going to do. It's not about Joseph. Joseph is ready to give an answer. If you go back to verse 16, Joseph puts himself in second place. Joseph then answered Pharaoh saying, It is not in me. It is God. And in the Hebrew, it's the other way around. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. It is not me. He puts God first. And when you look at how he interprets these dreams, in contrast to how he interpreted the cupbearer's dream, the baker's dream, in the cupbearer's dream, Joseph inserted himself in the narrative saying, well, remember me. Do you remember? Remember me. Don't forget me when you get out of here. Remember me. In this part of the story, Joseph says nothing about himself. It's all about Pharaoh and God. And he has more opportunity to be self-serving than he did with the cupbearer. But he says nothing. God has prepared Joseph for this very thing. 
God has prepared him for this, this moment. Joseph has the opportunity to be very self-serving or he can remain humble. This past month was the Super Bowl. And they were interviewing players, former players, and Randy Moss, who at the time was playing for the 49ers, he was in the Super Bowl. I don't know if you all heard this, but Randy Moss was given a microphone, which is always an exciting moment, uh, and he said, I am the greatest wide receiver of all time. He said that out loud. You could say that in your room or to your wife, but you don't say that out loud in front of a microphone. And at that time, Jerry Rice happened to be in the room. And Jerry Rice raised three fingers. You know what the three fingers mean? Super Bowl one, two, and three. Randy Moss has zero. I think he's played in two, but he has zero championships. Jerry Rice, one, two, three. Later on, they asked Jerry Rice, so what did you think about Randy Moss's comments about being the greatest wide receiver of all time? And Jerry Rice says, I'll let the fans and the analysts decide that. That's not my place. I'm not suggesting Jerry Rice is the most humble man on the planet, okay? Don't get me wrong, but you see the contrast. You have an opportunity to be self-serving. Joseph does, but he's learned humility. He's learned not to do that. He has put himself second. God is first. If God wants to elevate Joseph, God will elevate Joseph. God has all of this in play. Joseph has been subtracted. He has been waiting, and now he is going to let God establish Joseph, not Joseph. He's prepared. He's prepared to give a good answer. He's prepared to give Pharaoh what Pharaoh needs. And then verse 33 through 36, some, Joseph does something that's a little bit different. There he is in the middle of Pharaoh's courtroom. All eyes are upon him for the prison prophet, the secret seer, the condemned dreamer, the forgotten son to reveal the dream. Everyone is watching and waiting for his insight, and he gives it. He interprets the dream, but he does it with something that's very unique. He does it with grace. He's not only unaware, he's not only prepared, but Joseph is gracious in how he delivers this dream. You would think that he could have a chip on his shoulder. You'd think at some moment that he would have an opportunity to go ahead and be self-serving and put himself up first, but he does not. He is gracious in how he responds to Pharaoh. I see that in what he says. Pharaoh asks for an interpretation, not a solution. And Joseph gives him a solution. Not only the facts mercy, giving him exactly what's coming. I'll, I'll interpret the dream for you. But then he gives him something he doesn't deserve. Pharaoh doesn't ask for answers. Joseph gives it to him. He says, I'm not only going to tell you what the dream means, I'm going to tell you what you need to do as a result of this dream. He gives him the answers. He is discerning and he is wise. Pharaoh needs to act right now to save the kingdom. He needs to appoint an overseer to administrate the gathering and distribution of the food to the people. The overseer is going to need to know how to relate to the poor and to the rich. Anybody come to mind? This overseer is going to need to be sensitive to people, wise with resources, familiar with how things work at the top of government and at the bottom. Anybody come to mind? Joseph, this man is going to be, be aware of agricultural industry, the economy, storage of goods. He's going, to be, he's going to need to be humble, faithful, skilled, able to work hard, and be patient. He's going to need to have a track record of being faithful in the little things so he can be trusted with many things. This overseer is going to need to have a proven track record of loyalty to Pharaoh, seeking Pharaoh's good and not his own. This man is going to be, is going to be familiar with much and little and can identify with those who are without as well as those who have plenty. Anybody fit the bill for that? If you're looking for a candidate for that, who might fit the bill? Who's done all of those things? <coughs> Joseph has. But Joseph lays it out to him and says, you need to do this. You need to have a man who will oversee these things. Let Pharaoh take action in verse 34. Appoint overseers in charge and let him exact a fifth of the produce. Land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. It gives him a good plan, an exact plan. This man needs to know how to do the little things, the small things, so that he can do the big things. And sometimes when you're in life and you're stuck in that moment where all you see are some things, you don't know what God is doing. And that's Joseph's experience. He's working on a prison. Who cares about a prison? Joseph's faithful in the little things, having no idea what God is going to put in front of him. Those little things refined his skills in such a way to where he excelled at the very top of power. 
It's exciting to see because that next section right there is where Joseph is esteemed. And what's fun about this is what God built in the dungeon, God displays in the palace. Joseph gets the job. What God does in the dungeon of his life, God displays in the palace. God puts it on stage for everybody to see. Because in the land of affliction, we learn dependence. And isn't that awesome how that works? Joseph will say that in just a little while towards the end. He'll say, in the land of affliction, God has made me fruitful. In the land of affliction, you're fruitful? The only way you can see that kind of fruit is if you were to have a soft heart towards God, letting God work. Being faithful in the little things, believing that God knows some, that you only know some things, but God knows all things. Joseph is faithful. He is faithful in what God has built in the dungeon, God has displayed in the palace. And you might be thinking, well, I've been working in the dungeon of my life for so many years. When is the palace going to come? I don't want to make false promises here. Sometimes the palace is called heaven. And you don't realize how it all comes together until you step to the other side. Faithful to the very end. Our Old Testament saints all learned faithfulness. Even when they died waiting. Abraham died waiting. Isaac dies waiting. Moses dies waiting. Sometimes that's how that works. But God builds in the dungeon and displays in the palace His sovereignty, His wisdom in all things. And then lastly, you get Joseph's esteem. Joseph is placed at the top. He is now established inside of the, as the second ruler inside of Egypt. And when you look at that, his clothing that he gets... In verse 42, then Pharaoh took off his signet ring. That's a symbol of authority and puts it on Joseph's hands. He is clothed in fine linen in verse 42. That's a a garment that you'd wear in the courtroom. And then he is a gold necklace placed around his neck. That is a, a piece of jewelry that would indicate special favor from the royal family. So he gets the authority, favor, and clothing of a man of high position in the land of Egypt. He has gone from the dungeon to the palace. And he had no idea what was taking place. I find that to be fascinating, don't you? No idea, because in the land of affliction, we learn dependence. And that's what God has done in his life. He's learned to trust God for all things. And God is molding him into the man that he needs him to be. God is building him to the person that he needs at the top. And that's what he does in all of our lives. He works on us when we're in the dark. And then he displays it in light. Sometimes you get to see it. Other times you have to wait until you arrive in heaven. But we learn dependence in the land of affliction. And earth is the land of affliction. Amen? How many of you are sore this morning for some reason? Tired. (laughs) Landry, you're sore. You're like 13. (laughs) But we learn dependence when we let God work in our hearts and lives in this land of affliction. One of the things that stood out to me as we compressed the Old Testament with the New Testament, the New Testament says, for God works all things together for good to those that love Him. Because we have Scripture, we know that God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful, all-knowing in all things. We also learn through Scripture that you and I only know some things. And so really, here's the choice. When you're going through your life and you're in that land of affliction, you know, quite frankly... Some things. Isn't that discouraging? Some things. You only know this much. And sometimes we're tempted to make a lot of decisions based on some things. The little bit that we know. And you can make decisions on some things. But it's going to be an incomplete equation because you don't know all things. You only know some things. God knows all things. So we have to choose to make decisions based on some things versus all things. We choose our own faith and what we know in some things, or we trust God that subtraction does indeed at the end of the day equal addition, because God knows all things. We know some things, He knows all things, that while God is waiting, while we're waiting on God, He is at work because, you see, He knows all things. We only know some things. And if we make all of our decisions based on just some things, We could end up in a ditch because we only know some things. Whatever the tragedy might be, whatever the blessing might be, today it's a blessing, tomorrow might be a curse. My dad bought a boat when we were kids. It was a blessing. 
At first, <laughs> yeah, if you ever own a boat, you hear me, don't you? Later, it turned into a curse. Get this thing out of my driveway. God knows all things. You know some things. And you have to choose. Who are you going to believe? Your some things or God's all things? For Joseph, I believe that he just trusted God to know all things. And he was faithful with some things. Which will you do? Will you choose option one? Building your life around some things, responding to tragedies because you think it's all things? Or let God have all of those things and just walk by faith believing that God is at work and He's going to move in a way that will bring Him glory. And it might be when you step into paradise, you might realize, wow, God, I had no idea what you were doing. <laughs> I'm glad I trusted you with some things because you have all things in mind, all of it, believing that God takes care of everything. Choose some things versus all things. I pray that you will choose all things, that God knows everything more than you could ever hope or imagine. And nothing will separate you from the love of God, that He is able to do more than you could ever think or imagine. He's confident in the future. He has it ironed out. You just have to trust Him and believe Him, being faithful with what you know and trusting Him for what you don't. He is good and faithful. So let's trust Him. Father, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to follow you. You are an awesome and a mighty God who has all things under control, who has all things in view. Father, we can only see some things. But we see in the life of Joseph a man who experienced incredible subtraction. Then he had addition. We see a man who was waiting patiently for you, and you were working. While he was in the dungeon, you were working on him, in him, so that one day you would work through him. Father, he was gracious when you esteemed him. You put him to the top. He was gracious and kind. And he was faithful. And you helped him be fruitful in the land of affliction. And Lord, this isn't even the end of his story. He thinks that it's over. It's not. It's not. Lord, you were going to bring him full circle. And in so doing, bring glory to yourself. And Lord, I pray that our stories echo that of Joseph. That we would be faithful with some things, trusting you for all knowing that you will work, faithful with the some things that we know, and trusting you for the all things you have under your control. And as your eyes are closed and your heads are bowed, think about it for just a little while. Some things versus all things. Be faithful in some things. Trust him in all things. Be faithful with what God has given you, those little things, those some things. But know that he is working in all things. And maybe you're struggling in a moment right now with the tragedy, with the that subtraction part of the equation, maybe you're waiting on God. You can only see some things. Commit today that you'll just keep waiting. To just keep waiting. You're working. God is working. And He's primarily working in you to bring about humility, to bring about grace, to bring about dependence. Allow Him to have His way inside of your heart. To bring about those things. And if He so chooses to bring clarity and why those things have happened while you're still breathing, praise the Lord. If not, you're committed to be faithful in some things. God is worthy of our trust in all things. And you might be sitting in your chair and you've experienced them some things. And you're on the back side of it now. You're older now. You've seen those some things come to fruition. Give glory to God. He turned those subtractions, those waiting rooms, those difficult days into glory. You're able to see it today. You can see how God has used those things. Give glory to Him. We serve a God who takes all things, the good and the bad, and brings glory to Himself. As a result, joy to those who call him Savior. I spend a few moments in silent prayer thinking about these things. <coughs> are sometimes filled with things that just cause us to be so distracted, cause us to be so frustrated, hurt on the inside. And you are familiar with those hurts. You are familiar with those aches and those pains. You've promised that you will bring about healing. You will bring about reason. You will bring about truth to all of them as we wait upon you. You will cause us to soar, run, or walk. 
the key component is waiting. Pray you help us to be faithful in waiting, trusting in you to bring about those things. We love and thank you for the grace that you've shown us in Christ. It gives us the reason to endure, the reason to keep walking. We pray that you find us faithful.